and how wonderful it is that all of us have the privilege of going to our library and then going anywhere in the world we want to go in any time period that we want to be and meet people we certainly couldn't have met any other way. That's the value of libraries. Today's program is entitled Norman Rockwell, The Man and His Art. And I think if I were to put 10 people in front of one piece of art, I would get 10 different interpretations of what that art was, whether it was good or not, and whether or not a person would dare to have it in their own home. Art is one of those topics that it polarizes people. I happen to love the old masters, the classics, but I also love Clementine Hunter, folk, folk artist. So I have, I guess, eclectic tastes in art. There are others, though, who are very specific about what kind of art is fine art and what kind of art is just so-so art, just drawings or something. That's one of the problems that our fellow today had in his entire career. He, he wanted to be considered a fine artist, but somehow he always got pigeonholed into he just draws. Of course, he got the last laugh on that, which we're going to find out today. This is his picture, his portrait. He's a, a rather slender man, you can see. His name was Norman Percival Rockwell, and right now he's probably turning over in his grave because I told you all that Percival was his middle name. He hated it. His mother loved it. He was born in February of 1894, and he died in November of 1978. As I was saying, the question that dogged Rockwell for his entire, entire artistic life was, am I a fine artist? Or am I just an illustrator? He wanted to be remembered. He wanted to be important because of his work. And it really wasn't until the end of his life, very close to it, that he was discovered and his art was finally looked upon as fine art. Let's look at two definitions to kind of get us all on the same page about this. Fine art as opposed to illustration art. Fine art is a creative piece of art made by an artist, a painter, or a sculptor. And it's exhibited usually in an art show, and it's for sale. The fine artist is searching for understanding truth as he knows it and making some sense of the chaotic world we live in. He also answers to no one but himself. Illustration art is different. It refers to works of art that appeal to basically the mass public. The human eye like drawings and paintings. The illustrator is paid to portray a client's message through a picture or a painting. His art is commissioned and it's usually reproduced in print uh, or one of the other forms of media. Rockwell said this, Quote, some people have been kind enough to call me a fine artist. I've always called myself an illustrator. I'm not sure what the difference is. All I know is that whatever type of work I do, I try to give it my very best. Art has been my life. And let me tell you, art was this man's life. He was consumed by it. Before I did the research on this, I, of course, had seen Rockwell paintings. I, I knew what they looked like. I could recognize his style. But I didn't know anything about Norman Percival Rockwell, the man. To find out what he was really like and what his life was like, and to 
maybe through that understand his art better, I sought out books and I settled on two. There is to date only one autobiography by Norman Rockwell. It was ghostwritten by his son, Thomas, and it was actually published twice. We'll get into that in a minute. I used that one as one of the two books with which to do my research. This is the book. It's called Norman Rockwell, My Adventures as an Illustrator, an autobiography by Norman Rockwell as told to Thomas Rockwell. It was published in January of 1960. And to help you understand, Thomas Rockwell was his, uh, Norman Rockwell's middle son. And he uh, ultimately became a writer himself. Uh, his specialty was children's books. There are a number of books, though, available about Rockwell's art, how he produced his work, sort of the mechanics that he used as an artist. But there are really very, very few that delve into his personal life. I chose the one that has the highest rating to be my second book for research, and this is it. The title of it is American Mirror, The Life and Work and Art of Norman Rockwell. Deborah Solomon is the author, and it, she published it just November 2013. It's really still very new. She graduated from Cornell. She had a graduate, uh, had a degree in art history, and then she did a master's degree at the Columbia School of Journalism. She is considered by most to be a very respected art critic, very knowledgeable about artists and their lives, and she actually has written several biographies about American artists in addition to the one that she's done on Norman Rockwell. This is the second publication of Rockwell's autobiography. You notice it's published in May of 2019. You also may notice that the title has changed a little. Now it's Norman Rockwell as told to Tom Rockwell. Then my adventures as an illustrator and then the definitive edition. Thomas Rockwell the Sun, had reworked the original 1960 book to include more art and more information. And it was published to coincide with uh, an exhibition that was going to be in the Norman Rockwell Museum in 2019. Abigail Rockwell, one of Norman Rockwell's grandchildren, wrote the introduction to it. The definitive edition is prominent and very much a part of the title now. Turns out that there's a bit of competition going on between the Rockwell family heirs and the art critic who told the story of his life. Solomon's book was very well received by virtually everyone except the Rockwell heirs. This was in spite of the fact that it was Jarvis Rockwell Norman's other, another of his sons and Thomas's brother who actually suggested to Solomon that she write a biography of his father after he read an article on Norman Rockwell that she had written in 1999. He told her that no serious biography of his father had yet been written and one needed to be. Solomon was also invited to do a book launch with signing and her public uh, presentation of the book at the Norman Rockwell Museum in October of 2013 before the book itself came out the next month. Tom and Abigail continue to fight the good fight. Um, the problem is, of course, the autobiography is an excellent work it provides us with some direct commentary made by Norman Rockwell because he got a dictaphone and when he was in his studio and he couldn't paint, then he would recall things. And Tom look, took a lot of that to put together in, in the autobiography. Um, it's a fine book, but it's not really in-depth. It's not really detailed. 
Solomon had access to papers, documents, letters, correspondence, all kinds of material that, of course, Norman Rockwell and Thomas didn't have for Rockwell's autobiography. Rockwell saved a lot of things. So did his wives. So did others. And so it meant that she had some firsthand information, facts about his life that the others, if they knew, they didn't bother to write about. So if you're going to read the books, I'd recommend you read them both because together they give you the full picture. Norman Rockwell's art really achieved notoriety when he won the contract to do a, a number of covers for the Saturday Evening Post. This one is one of my very favorites. It's entitled Gramps at the Plate and it was in the August 1916 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. And it's delightful. You have the little boy who's obviously playing catcher, and you have a very determined grandpa who's going to hit that ball no matter what. Rockwell said this about his work. He said, I unconsciously decided that even if it wasn't an ideal world, it should be so and painted only the ideal aspects of it. Pictures in which there are no drunken slatterns or self-centered mothers, only foxy grandpas who played baseball with kids, and boys who fished from logs and got up circuses in the backyard. Most people assume then that Rockwell must have had an idyllic childhood. He didn't even though he painted wonderful pictures that depict all kinds of aspects of family life. You've got families seated around dining tables and carefree children happily at play. His own childhood and family life was not idyllic. Let me put it this way. The Rockwells were not the cleavers of Leave it to Beaver fame. This is a portrait, this is a portrait of Norman portrait Rockwell's family. Of His parents were married in 1891 his father was Jarvis Waring Rockwell, and he preferred to be called Waring. And his mother was Ann Nancy Hill, and she preferred to be called Nancy. They had two children, Jarvis Waring Rockwell Jr., who was born in 1892, and Norman Percival Rockwell, who was born two years later in 1894. The family lived in a series of homes all within you know, close distance of, of each other. From 1891 to 1906, the family's home was in New York City. Then from 1906 to 1913, they lived in Mamoronic, New York. And then in 1913, New Rochelle, New York. The importance about the New Rochelle is that it was an artist colony. This was exactly what Norman needed. Uh, the same thing about Mamoronic, that also had a strong influence on his art because he was surrounded by people who appreciated art, loved art. His father and mother were a pair, interesting pair. Waring was the third child of a family of, of some means. He worked as a salesman for a textile company in Manhattan. He sang ba bass very well, and he was very proud of that. And so he was always in the church choirs, and he also was in some amateur singing groups. He dated Nancy Hill for several years before they married. He was 23. She was 25. He was a quiet man. And Rockwell said that he was kind to a fault. And he described his, his father further as weak and ineffective. Nancy was the fifth child of a family that had immigrated from England. And her family was made up of artists. Her father, Howard Hill, was a struggling artist who painted houses when he couldn't get anybody to buy his paintings. He loved to paint groups of ducks and quail against very scenic landscapes. 
some of the art critics have suggested he probably would have been fine as a landscape artist if he didn't have the ducks and the quail in there. Or he might have been really quite fine working with ducks and quail if he hadn't had the landscape in there. So it's a little bit busy. He was not very successful, but he was always a dreamer. At one point, he decided that mass marketing his drawings might make a difference in their income. So he turned his own children into an artist workshop and he would draw the outline of what the painting was to be. And then each child would get, a co get it and add to it that thing that that child had been assigned to add. It might be the moon, it might be trees. Nancy hated it. And she swore that when she grew up, she would never go near oil paints again. And she's the mother of Norman Rockwell. Nancy's brother, Thomas, actually had a fairly promising art career, but he died early, and that, that ended that. Her mother, Anne, died in 1886. Her father, Howard, died in 1888. Which meant, which meant that Nancy Hill was an orphan at age 22, and she won't marry for three years. She's trying to get her feet back under her. Norman described his mother as, quote, a hypochondriac who spent her days visiting doctors. Not a very cheerful family picture. This is a picture of the Rockwell boys. Uh, Norman is seated and his brother is standing beside him. Rockwell said this, I wasn't a regular Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. I wasn't an excessively brave kid. I wasn't very healthy. My brother, Jarvis Jr., was quite the opposite, and this had a lot to do with my life. He later played semi-professional baseball and football. He was the real boy's boy. Norman had some interesting and sometimes conflicting childhood memories. Among them are these. Jarvis Jr., his brother, older brother, was a good student, and Norman barely passed his grades. He had a lot of trouble with reading and with writing, and so some of the scholars today insist that he must have been dyslexic, and it could be. Jarvis Jr. also enjoyed robust, good health. Norman was nearsighted, pigeon-toed, too tall, and too thin. When President McKinley was assassinated, the horror of that remained with Norman Rockwell through his entire life. He remembered the people rushing home with the, the uh, small papers that had just been printed as an emergency to pe tell people that the, the uh, president had been killed and, and how frightened everybody was. This is before radios, of course. This is before any kind of mass uh, information tools. The thing, though, that really bothered him in his childhood was his mother's insistence that both he and his brother say grace before every dinner, that they attend church every Sunday, that they sing in the church choir, all boys choir, and that meant three rehearsals a week, including a full dress rehearsal every Friday night, and she wouldn't let the boys play with their toys or read the funny papers on Sunday. All of that contributed to the adult Norman never having very much to do with religion during his adult life. This is an interesting, I think, fun picture. I picked it. It is a cover from The Country Gentleman, and it shows a young boy who leaves the chains of school and he opens himself up to the joys that come in summertime. The reason I picked it was because Norman's happiest childhood memory was the annual summer family vacation that they took where they spent two weeks on a working farm in the Adirondack Mountains. He especially enjoyed the hayrides, eating meals at long tables with the farm help, 
and the freedom that he had to do pretty much anything he pleased. This June 21st, 1919 cover of The Country Gentleman captures that spirit of summer. You know, his education was more limited than I expected to see. In 1909s, he enters Mamoronek High School, and also he's allowed to begin taking classes at the Chase School of Art in New York City. In 1910, the year later, he leaves high school after his sophomore year, and he begins studying art at the National Academy of Design in New York. And then the year after that, he begins studies at the Art Students League. He's admitted into this. It's a very prestigious group. And he focuses his art on illustration. A couple of things you need to know about that. He was 14 when he began taking art lessons. And when he was 15, he joined the Art Students League, was invited to. And to put the Art Students League in context, Georgia O'Keeffe is one of their most famous uh, alums. Besides the Saturday Evening Post and the covers that he painted for them, the other continuum that flows through his artistic life is the Boy Scouts of America. Some of his earliest work was for them. This particular cover is of Boy's Life, which is the Boy Scout magazine, and he did it, produced it for them. The title of it is Scout at Ship's Wheel, and it was published in September 1916. In 1912, he was commissioned to create a few little illustrations for two small books. Before that, by two years, he had been commissioned by a neighbor to create Christmas cards for him, for them. And the bad thing, of course, is none of those Christmas cards still exist. So that earliest little paying job, we, we don't know. 1913, he became the art editor for Boy's Life magazine, and he sells his first cover, which was the one you just saw, Scout at Ship's Wheel. In 1916, then three years later, he sells his first cover to the Saturday Evening Post. I think it's amazing that those two happened so quickly, so early on in his life, his artistic life because they become the ones that continue through most of his artistic life. That first cover that he sold to the Saturday Evening Post was called Boy with Baby Carriage. This is a picture of it. Uh, it was published in May 1916, and if you look very closely at it, you see that you have two boys who obviously aren't having to take care of baby something, sister or brother. They're off to play and frolic, and they're kind of smirking at the young man who's all dressed up and pushing a baby carriage. And if you can tell in his pocket, is showing is the nipple of a baby bottle with formula so that he can also feed this child. And one assumes he's also going to have to change the diapers. It's one of the... the favorites of the Rockwell covers. He produced 323 different covers for the Saturday Evening Post. His professional relationship with the Boy Scouts of America lasted 64 years. His final Boy Scouts illustration was finished when he was 82 years old. It's believed, again, this is where the scholars have come into it, to, to just really nail down since so much of his work, early work, besides these covers that you've seen, were ads, little ads in magazines that had to have design work, a little image. Um, Campbell Soup would have a little Campbell Soup can, for example, that he'd have to produce it. Anyway, today it's generally agreed that Rockwell produced over 4,000 advertising illustrations and paintings. When he does a cover, he does a painting, and then the people who are going to print it make a print of it to use for their covers, but the, the painting stands alone as its own. He never, ever worked at night, and he never 
ever painted under an electric light. He said it changed the colors of his paints and he would not do that no matter what. In 1917, Country Gentleman published the first cover and then from 1917 to 1922, Rockwell created a series of covers for Country Gentlemen, and they all depicted, they were like little continuing stories. They depicted a city slicker whom he named Reginald Claude Fitzhugh, and he was constantly being victimized by his country cousins who were a little bit smarter and knew country ways that he didn't. Then in 1918, the Navy magazine, Afloat and Ashore, commissioned Rockwell to do some illustrations for them. And the Saturday Evening Post liked several of those so, those so much that they requested covers made of naval officers. This is one of the country gentlemen um, covers that he did that shows Reginald. The title of it is Cousin Reginald Catches the Thanksgiving Turkey and it's December 1917. And you can see in the background just over the snowbank, the country cousins and their dog obviously laughing at poor Reginald who doesn't know how to deal with turkeys. Lots going on in Norman Rock Rockwell's young life. In 1960, he marries a school teacher Irene O'Connor. You may wonder why I haven't mentioned his love life before. It's because it was very short. Older brother Jarvis had been dating Irene, and Norman decided that he needed a wife, and he knew Irene, and so he went for Irene, and Irene decided he must be a better choice, and so she married him. The marriage did not get off to such a great start. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Two years after they were married, Norman enlists in the United States Navy, 1918. You know what's happening here. This is the First World War where the whole world is going, about to go completely crazy. He spends four months, his entire naval career, stationed in Charleston, South Carolina. And then he receives an ineptitude discharge from military service. It's because he's 17 pounds underweight and he can't eat enough to weigh enough to make it. This is a picture of Norman with his first wife, Irene. I was in the 1920 May 2nd issue of the Chicago Tribune, so this is a social thing, big deal. They're obviously not dressed like normal people. They're dressed like people going to a costume party. They divorced after 14 years and they had no children. I mentioned earlier that the marriage didn't get off to a great start. One week after they got married, she went home to her parents and stayed for two months. And then she came back and shortly after that, he took a trip and stayed for a while and came back. They never clicked. They never really were good together. They were not helpers. Ironically, though, five years after they were married, Rockwell actually features her on a cover. I want to talk about that ineptitude discharge. This is what his commander wrote about him when he was mustered out of the Navy. He said, quote, Rockwell is an artist and unaccustomed to hardship and manual labor. His patriotic impulse caused him to enlist in a rating for which he has no aptitude. Moreover, he is unsuited to naval routine and hard work. This is the cover five years after they were married. It's the Literary Digest, and it features a mother putting two children to bed. And the mother is Irene, his first wife. She posed for the picture. The irony, of course, is rich. They never had children. But she's lovely there, and she looks, she looks pretty maternal to me. It's a beautiful, beautiful cover. Rockwell said about the 1920s, the 20s ended in an era of extravagance, sort of like the one we're in now. There was a big crash, and then the country picked itself up again, and we had some great years. 
Those were the days when America believed in itself. I was happy and proud to be painting it. This is another of Norman Rockwell's paintings that was, of course, converted into a Saturday Evening Post cover. It's one, another one that's really very popular with the general public. It's entitled Tipping the Scales, and it was published in October of 1936. And you can see there the lovely little lady with her little hat with flowers and her little patterned dress, and she's buying a chicken from a grocer, and the grocer is looking up at the scale, and he's holding the scale down just a little bit to get the weight a little higher. Even as, if you look, underneath the scale, her finger is lifting it up so she'll have a little less weight. So you have, uh, they're both tipping the scales. She's very matronly and she's very lovely. And she is more like the women that Rockwell painted than any else. This is what he said about painting women. Quote, I learned to draw everything except glamorous women. No matter how much I tried to make them look sexy, they always ended up looking silly or like somebody's mother. It's interesting. There's been quite a lot of, of reference made amongst the art critics and the scholars, the art historians, about the majority of the people that Norman Rockwell painted were boys and men, uh, well, actually two old men, all ages of male. And he did paint quite a few females, and he painted those all ages too but it was clear that his preference was the male figure. This is not unusual in art. Uh, even sculptors will tell you that they have a preference of one gender or the other, that they, they just feel like they, they create better, the art's better. He was like that with his, the male figures. In the 30s, Rockwell had many changes again going on in his life. In January, 1930, his divorce from Irene is final, so he's a free man. And in four months, he marries again. Another really short courtship. His second wife is Mary Barstow, and he had met her just a few months earlier. He meets her in California. He's in California kind of studying art and talking to artists out there and seeing where his art might fit in. This is an article from um, Alhambra, California, from their newspaper. And it says, Norman Rockwell takes wife, model. April 17th, Norman Rockwell, famous artist and magazine illustrator, today took upon himself a wife and a subject. She was Mary R. Barstow, college grad, resident of this town, and a grandniece of the late Judge Albert H. Gary, steel magnate. Old Norman's done well with this marriage. The ceremony was performed at the bride's home here by Reverend Robert Freeman. Soon afterwards, they packed up and left for New York, where they will honeymoon and in the future reside. Rockwell will use his wife for a subject in many of his drawings, he said. So he's married his model. Here she is, and she's quite lovely. She has a beautiful smile, beautiful face. Uh, and he does use her, not as much as most people would have expected, but he uses her some, and, and it goes well. That's two marriages, and I'm going to tell you, he marries three times. All three of his wives would have told you the same thing, and that is he was not an easy man to live with. He is an artist. He is eccentric. Every one of those women he married learned that Norman's life really was art. So he had a very strict routine, and he followed it absolutely, and they just had to you know, adjust around what his routine was. He painted all day, every day, 
that he was at home in their home, whichever home it might be. He painted that seven days a week. Remember, his mother cured him of religion, so he's not going to be worried about going to church. So all day, every day, seven days a week when they are at home, he had the same breakfast every day, two Coca-Colas. That was for the caffeine to get him going. Then he would go to the studio and he'd have a light lunch, usually a sandwich and one cookie. In the winter, he swapped the sandwich out for a can of Campbell's tomato soup, only the tomato soup, and the one cookie. And then he had another light meal for dinner. He could not stand heavy foods. He would not eat a casserole. He liked just meat and maybe a vegetable sort of hidden somewhere, but nothing much. And sometimes he would splurge and he would have a scoop of ice cream, but it would always be vanilla ice cream. And he liked to have a rum and coke to drink. He, in the wintertime, would have two rums and cokes to drink. He wore his shoes too small because he thought it hid the fact that he was so pigeon-toed. He was phobic about germs and cleanliness. And this one is one that Miss Solomon goes into <laughs> with delicious detail. I mean, he would completely clean his studio every day, several times a day, including his brushes, whether they'd been used or not. And he always used ivory snow. As I said, he was not an easy man to live with. 1931, his father Waring dies, and this jolts him. September of that same year, he and Mary have their first child, his first son. They named the son Jarvis, of course, after his daddy. This is a picture of Rockwell in their home, and he has Jarvis on his lap, and he's reading him a book. And I rather suspect he's showing him the illustrations, too, to make some points early about how pretty paintings can be. The next year, the Rockwells go to Paris with their young child, and they spend nine months there because Norman wants to see the interesting faces he perceives must be in Paris. Uh, he gets a rented studio, he picks up his routine, and he, he does paint every day, but mostly in Paris what he's doing is taking a sketchbook, and he's going out into the streets and just sitting and observing interesting faces, and then he's, he's drawing them so one day they'll show up in some of his paintings. The following year, 1933, Rockwell and Mary have a second child, another son. This one they named Thomas. This is a picture of Norman with Jarvis and Thomas, and they're all obviously kind of having a good time. You notice that Jarvis is going to get to his dad's height almost, but not quite. You don't know about Thomas. He looks like he might be a, a little bit shorter, but we'll see. And then in 1934, Irene, wife number one, dies. And Rockwell was always convinced that that was a suicide based on how he knew her. No proof, but that was what he believed. In 1936, Rockwell illustrates Mark Twain's Adventures of Tom Sawyer. It's for Heritage Press, and these are some of the most beloved of his illustration works. September of 1936, Rockwell and Mary have yet a third child, another son, and they named this one Peter. This picture of the three boys, I mean, it just says joy to me. They all look like they're having a great time, that they love each other, and maybe it's not all that bad to have to sit there in short pants and have your picture taken. This is one of the illustrations from the adventures of Tom Sawyer that he did for Heritage Press. Its title of this one is Tom Sawyer Whitewashing the Fence. You'll see this one reproduced in a lot of books about Twain because it's so utterly charming. You have 
one boy very carefully painting, the other boy very carefully judging that it's done just right. 1936 for this one. I think one of the most interesting things that I found out about Rockwell was that he actually painted a mural. And it turns out he only painted one in his whole career, but what a one it was. He painted it in 1937. It's the largest mural of his career, besides being the only mural of his career. It runs along the wall of the tap room at the Nassau Inn in Princeton, New Jersey. And when it was finished, it contained 20 humans, two dogs, one pony, and one goose. It, it was, it's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. This is a full picture of the whole thing. It's really quite, it's all the way behind the bar. So it's, it's a long painting. The title of it was Yankee Doodle. And it was paid for, he was commissioned by a Princeton grad who'd made a fortune in one of the heavy metals. And so um, the guy wanted Yankee Doodle, he wanted something that would be appropriate to Princeton. This Nassau Inn was a place where the Princeton students loved to go and, and have a drink. And so did the people of Princeton, New Jersey, who were not even associated with the university. So he wanted to have something that would commemorate this, the, the specialness of this particular room, the tap room. If you look carefully at the mural, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a very tall gentleman, and he's wearing a red cape. He's on the edge. That's Norman Rockwell. He actually painted himself into this picture. It reminds me of Alfred Hitchcock, who always had a little picture. He was in his movies, no matter what movie it was. Rockwell wasn't like that exactly, but every so often he would put himself in a painting. And it generally, as nearly as I can tell, it generally marked something he was particularly proud of, something that was important to him. He was the model for himself, obviously, but he got other people from the Princeton area to put on period costumes that he had collected and pose for him for each one of those other 19 people in that uh, mural. It took him nine months to get all of them the way he wanted them so that he could put them into the mural. By the way, one of the eccentricities about Rockwell was that he loved props and especially early in his career, he loved props and he loved live models. Now, as he ages, he begins having someone take pictures of his live models. And then later he will paint from the pictures. And he said that it was easier than watching them squirm after 30 minutes of having to hold their neck a certain way and it was killing them. If they could just hold it the certain way, get a picture taken, then they, they were happier and he got a better face uh, as a result. This mural was endangered in 1985 because the Nassau Inn had to kind of be renovated. It's an old, old property to begin with. And they needed to sort of refurbish, redo, and that included the tap room and that included the mural. So they thought it over and they worked with the engineers and they worked with the other people involved in the reconstruction process and they devised a way to just cover the mural and work around it. That's all they could, they weren't going to touch it. You can't take it off, it's the wall. So they did. After that, though, when that, that refurbishment was finished for their room, they put a glass panel across the full length of the mural to protect it. Now, it had been there for a very long time, and nobody had sloshed beer on it or thrown a wine bottle that caught it or anything like that, but they started thinking about, maybe we should be careful with this, and then they also insured it. They insured his one and only mural for $1.8 million. In 1938, once the mural was finished, 
March of that year, Rockwell created some illustrations for Woman's Home Companion. And these illustrations were designed to accompany a story within that magazine about Louisa May Alcott. He got a pretty good bit of publicity for doing that. Later that spring, the Rockwells go back to England and they spend several months. Mary was pregnant again and they did not want a fourth child. So they traveled to England and she went to a private hospital and then she wasn't pregnant anymore. They stayed there for several months and then they came home and they purchased an 80-year-old farmhouse in Arlington, Vermont. October of that year, the Saturday Evening Post cover shows Roxwell's fixation with deadlines and his struggles with coming up with new material. This is the cover of it, October 1938. The title of the painting that the cover is showing is Artist Facing Blank Canvas. Look closely at this one. Right in front of him is a blank canvas, obviously, and he has already sort of penciled in the mass to the Saturday evening post. He's scratching his head. He has a paintbrush in his hand. Right directly above his head, he's got a horseshoe for good luck hanging on the top of the easel. And then he has his paints down below his saddle oxfords on his feet, and papers and books open and in disarray. Clearly, he has a deadline and he doesn't, absolutely has no idea what he's going to put on that cover. 1939, he had an easier time with it. They actually now move into this farm in uh, Vermont and he takes a small barn toward the rear of that property and has it redone or converted into a studio for him. The, the um, cover he didn't have any trouble with was called Marvel's Champion. You have it here, Saturday Evening Post. And um, a little girl seems to be beating the tar out of these two very unhappy little boys at Marvel's. She's better at it than they are. They're not happy. The 1930s brought so many changes to Norman Rockwell's wife, life. It seems to me that every decade, when you look back on it, you realize, my gosh, what he went through. 1930s, he divorced Irene. He married Mary. He had three sons. He traveled abroad, and he moved to idyllic New England. What would the 40s bring? This is a painting that Rockwell did in 1941. The title of it is A Scout is Helpful. And you see the scout. He's coming up out of a pool, and he's carrying a little child who's obviously fallen in. Rockwell painted for the Boy Scouts for over 50 years, and he did calendars, a calendar every year, one big art piece with the months underneath, and he did magazine covers for them with the um, Boy's Life. In the 40s, Rockwell's art reflects the historic time that America is experiencing, and the world too. Nobody wanted a Second World War, but a Second World War they got. And it's in the 1940s and during all that tension that, that occurred when we were at war again, he created four paintings that are arguably the finest of all of his work. These four placed Rockwell's art on a plane it had not reached previously. He became, for the first time, America's storyteller which was what he'd always hoped to be. Look at this quote. Without thinking too much about it in specific terms, I was showing the America I knew and observed to others who might not have noticed. My fundamental purpose is to interpret the typical American. 
I am a storyteller. And you know, that's the thing that's most consistent about his illustrations and about his paintings, mostly though about the paintings. If you look at them carefully, they do create a story for you. You can start imagining the little girl beating the little boys at marbles, which is supposed to be their game. You can just put in that, in your mind, the context of how irritated those little boys really are. And if she makes that shot she's about to make, it's all over for them. I mean, a girl has beaten them, for heaven's sakes. He's a storyteller. In the 40s, 1940, he illustrates his second Mark Twain book. This time, he's hired to do The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And in September of 1940, the Selective Training and Service Act initiates the first peacetime draft. This is a time when people need solace, people need encouragement, and people need to come together to support the war effort. January of 1951, President Frank D. Roosevelt named four freedoms during his State of the Union Address. The freedoms were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. That resonated with Rockwell. He thought about it and thought about it. In October, he produced a cover using G.I. Willie Gillis as his star, and this was for the Saturday Evening Post but he kept thinking about FDR's speech. And here's an excerpt from it, so you'll see why it resonated with him. He delivered it, FDR did, to Congress and to the American people on January 6, 1941. Quote, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression. The second is freedom of every purpose, person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear anywhere in the world. He's thinking about it. He does his Willie Gillis package from home piece. This is, you see it here, it's the Saturday Evening Post cover. And obviously, G.I. Willie Gillis, he's new, he's green, but he has a prize. He has a package from home. No doubt his mother has put cakes and cookies and other special things. And you see all the others behind him looking over his shoulder, waiting waiting until he opens so they can get some too. That was October of 1941. He's still thinking about Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms. In the spring of 1942, the next year, he pays a visit to the Office of War Information in Washington, D.C., and he presents several poster concepts. And among those were posters that sort of interpreted FDR's Four Freedoms. He wanted to contribute to the war effort by creating paintings that would depict visually each one of those four abstractions that Roosevelt had named. <laughs> the Office of War Information turned him down. They didn't want him. On his way back from that disappointment, he stopped in and had a visit with his editor at the Saturday Evening Post told him what had happened. The editor commissioned all four of them on the spot for covers that uh, year, that fall, on uh, the Four Freedoms. They did something else. They redesigned the Saturday Evening Post people. They redesigned their masthead. So they're going to give more room for the art itself. The first piece that was done under that, um, that new design was not yet the Four Freedoms. It was another of his Willie Gillis ones. Here it is, it's, it's called What to Do in a Blackout. It's very striking because you see it's a solid black cover 
and you have two figures with a little light on them, a man and a woman. And they're reading what to do in a blackout. Clearly, the young man has a great idea of what they can do in the blackout. The young lady is thinking about it. She's looking at it too. This was in June of 1942. The reason there was a delay in putting the four freedoms on the cover was that Rockwell really struggled with how to make those abstract thoughts into something that people could identify with, that they could understand. Patrick Perry did a really fine article about the Four Freedoms in January 2018 in the Saturday Evening Post. The title of his article is Rockwell's Four Freedoms, and it reads like this. One night in bed, Rockwell was mulling over the proclamation, getting more discouraged as the hours ticked by. I suddenly remembered how my neighbor Jim Edgerton had stood up in a town meeting and said something that let everybody else disagreed with, Rockwell said. They had let him have his say. No one shouted him down. I thought, that's it. That's freedom of speech, a New England town meeting. Freedom from want, Thanksgiving dinner. I'll express the ideas in simple, everyday scenes, Rockwell said, in terms everybody can understand. In 1943, from February 20th through March 13th, Rockwell's interpretation of FDR's Four Freedoms appear as covers on the Saturday Evening Post. In April, the next month, Rockwell's Four Freedoms paintings go on a 16-city tour to support the Second War Loan Drive. They're selling war bonds. The tour is a huge success. It raises $132 million through war bond sales, and 1.2 million people get to see a Rockwell painting in person. Those Four Freedoms paintings propel him to new levels of fame. The general public knew him because of his work with the Saturday Evening Post, but now they knew him in a different way, and it's, it's a bigger way, I think. I want us to take a minute and look at each of the Four Freedoms paintings because these are considered to be the finest that he did, and I want you to notice the details. This is the first one. It's called Freedom of Speech. Remember he said in that quote that he remembered that his neighbor had stood up in a New England town meeting and he had spoken and nobody in the meeting agreed with him, but they didn't shout him down. They let him say his piece and, and went on. And he said, that's freedom of speech. Oh, if we only had that today. This one, the man is standing. He's obviously presenting. And look at the faces around him. You have one man uh, to our right, as you're looking at the painting, who's looking up, he's listening, he's paying attention, but you're not sure whether he's skeptical or whether he agrees. Directly behind the gentleman speaking, you see another man. All you see of him is a bit of his head and one eye, but his eye is looking at the speaker from behind. Then as you swing around, you have one woman who's pictured in it, and she's kind of looking around and, and clearly not sure what's going on. But the central figure in his audience is the man who's seen full face on the left. He's looking up. He has a bit of a smile on his face. And one wonders if he isn't pretty proud of this fellow for standing up for what he believes and what he thinks. See, Rockwell is a storyteller. We can look at a canvas and we can create a story that goes around it. The second one, freedom of worship. It's very poignant. It's very beautiful. You see he has text at the top that says, each according to the dictates of his own conscience. And then you have represented here all the faiths if you take time to take them apart, you can find the Catholic, 
You can find the Native American. You can find the African American. You can find I'm sure there's a Presbyterian and a Methodist and a Baptist in here too. They're all represented and the idea is all of us should have the freedom to worship as we please. I think the woman in the foreground of the painting who has her hands clasped and she's obviously in prayer, look at the details of that hair. Her hair which has been swept up and put in a little clip She's obviously gray. Look at the details of her wrinkles, not only on her face, but also on her hand. Rockwell is a genius with this. Freedom from want. This one he picks, Thanksgiving dinner. And you see the man who is going to carve the turkey stands proudly at the head of the table while the wife, who's clearly baked this gorgeous bird, places the bird in front of him so he can do the carving duties. And then around on either side of the table, you see happy, expectant faces. Everybody's ready for that meal. In the foreground, on the right-hand bottom corner, you see one fellow who's cutting his eyes around at us those of us who are looking at the painting. This is one of the things that Rockwell likes to do on occasion. And it's a way he says that he brings us to the table in this instance. And then finally, freedom from fear. You have a father and a mother. You've got two little children who are in their bed. Mama's tucking them in. And you have dad holding a newspaper which if you look very closely, speaks of the carnage going on overseas during the war. And the idea here is that at least we are free from the fear that our children will be murdered in the night. They're four magnificent paintings. Uh, there's really no other way to describe them. This is the pinnacle of his art. And this is when he begins his journey toward being discovered as a fine artist. One thing that Rockwell was known for was his ability to paint dogs. And they appear often in his work. This cover from July of 1931 of uh, the Saturday Evening Post shows a young boy and he's clearly trying to teach his dog to jump through the hula hoop. The name of the painting is Old Dog, New Tricks. And I don't know about you, but I don't see that this dog's really ever going to go through that hoop. He doesn't seem all that interested. He's much more interested in the plate of fried chicken, which is over beside the boy's foot. And the boy has a bone that he's trying to tempt the dog with. The dog's not stupid. The dog knows that he can get a piece of chicken that has meat on it, not just the bone. Ro Rockwell said this once, quote, if a picture wasn't going very well, I'd put, put, put a puppy dog in it, always a mongrel, you know, never one of the full bred puppies. And then I'd put a bandage on its foot. <laughs> he said, the view of life I communicate in my pictures excludes the sordid and the ugly. I paint life as I would like it to be. Of course, life in the 40s was a difficult time because of World War II. In 1943, right after the tour with the paintings of the Four Freedoms, Rockwell goes home, he's there for, I believe it's two weeks, and then his barn studio with all of its contents burned to the ground. So he has reached a level of recognition as an artist, and then his tools have, have gone away. So too were a number of paintings that he stored there that will, of course, never be recovered. The 29th of that same month, May 1943, 
The Saturday Evening Post publishes the cover that will become one of its most famous. It features Rosie the Riveter. She's, um, she's quite a gal. If you look at her, she's there. She's ready to conquer the world if necessary. She'll do whatever is necessary. It's a real tribute, tip of the hat, to the women who stepped up during the war to do their part at home, like learning to do rivets. Uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful piece, and it's a very popular piece. The model for Rosie the Riveter only weighed 110 pounds, <laughs> so he, he bulked her up a little bit for that one. In 46, in December, he used this painting for a Saturday Evening Post cover. It's called Boy in Dining Car. And you see, the fellow is, is studying very carefully the menu. I mean, here he is. He's in a very grown-up environment for a very small boy. And he wants to do things right. And, of course, the porter who's going to take his order is smiling a bit, if you look. He's, he's enjoying watching the boy be very serious in this a grown-up kind of attitude. Interestingly, that boy is Rockwell's youngest son, Peter. Peter will grow up to be a very fine sculptor. In 1948, Rockwell had what he called one of the real treats of his life. He met Grandma Moses. She's a primitivist, uh, a painter, and she had uh, quite, a, quite a following. He met her on his, uh, her 89th birthday, so it's toward the end of her career. And he honors her later that year with, by putting her in a group of people in a post cover, which is entitled Christmas Homecoming. And when you see there, remember it's 1948, people are coming home from the war. People are coming home from these places that they've had to be. They haven't seen their family in forever. And so here's one who's come home. Obviously, his wife has him in a great embrace. And if you look to the left, the little old lady with her hair up, the little glasses, uh, a cameo around her neck, and a white lace collar. That's Grandma Moses. He honored her, and she loved it. 1949, November. Rockwell does a painting that becomes a post cover, and the title of it is New Television Antenna. Look closely at this one. You've got some poor soul struggling on the rooftop with what at that point is a brand new, newfangled antenna to go with the brand new television sets. And he's trying to adjust it. If any of you are old enough to remember this, you had to adjust them usually manually. Later they had little uh, like gizmos that you could turn and it would mechanically you didn't have to get up on the porch, in other words. This kid's struggling, trying to get it just right. And it's for the man who's just below him. He's hanging out the window. In fact, he's so enthusiastic about getting a television set that he's knocked over his wife's plants in the window box. He'll be in trouble for that. But you can see from the joy on his face that the picture is coming in. So the antenna is where it should be. The irony of this is that the television is one of the reasons people stopped reading. And so you have him marking the beginning of the medium that was the beginning of the end of magazines like the Saturday Evening Post. In 1950, in the summer, Rockwell decides he's going to try his hand, and I think this is the third time, it may be the fourth, during his lifetime that he decides he's going to teach art students. So he hosts a summer art workshop. He invites six students from the Art Students League. Remember the one that George O'Keefe graduated from, and so did he. He invites them to come to West Arlington, which is where he's living now, and those six students study under him. When it was over, this is what he had to say, quote, 
I would take the wrong approach for a teacher, I guess. And there was always someone in the class who would raise an objection to my way. They'd want to get into an argument with me, and I was no good at arguing. So I figured if that was what teaching was like, I better leave it to someone who knows how to maneuver an argument. I'd stick to what I knew best, painting. 1951, November. This is the one of the most touching of many, I guess, touching paintings that Rockwell did. The title of it is Saving Grace. It's on the cover. This single painting, according to every source I could find, ranks as his most famous painting of all that he did and his most popular painting. If you look at it, you see it's a little lady and she has, looking like I'm sure somebody's mother, she's sitting uh, with her little hat on her head and she's wearing her little demure clothes and the things that she's been carrying are down by the side of her chair. And a little boy, obviously with her, is sitting at the table and he's leaning in toward her and both of them are in prayer. They're saying grace before they have their meal. Look at the expressions on everybody else's face. The other diners don't see this often. And some of them, if you look at them carefully, seem delighted that this is happening. Others are very skeptical and wondering why this public display of religion is happening at all. The young boy whose back you see, whose head is bowed toward his mother or his grandmother, that's his son Jarvis. In 19, I'm sorry, in 2013, 2013, Saying Grace was bought by an unidentified buyer for $46 million. $46 million. I'd say he'd made it to fine art status. 1952, 50s were interesting for Rockwell too. In October of that year, for the first time, he painted a presidential candidate's portrait and it was featured on the cover of Saturday Evening Post. And his person to paint was none other than the Allied Supreme Commander who was so popular at the time, Eisenhower. Rockwell would go on to paint portraits of John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and Ronald Reagan. He always said that it was Nixon's face that was the most difficult to paint. He said, look at him, he has squinty little eyes that are close together and a much broader lower jaw. He said it was almost impossible to get it just right. One of the, one of the paintings that he did of him to try to get it right, he finally just gives up and he turns him to the side and he puts his hand Nixon's hand under Nixon's face to try to balance some of it. It didn't really work. Of all those, he said that it was Lyndon Johnson who was the most uncooperative. He said that he, Rockwell could have 20 minutes and then he was busy, man, he had other things to do. And then someone else painted a portrait of Johnson and Johnson was infuriated by it. And the story goes that Johnson, when he saw it, saw the draft of it by this other artist who shall remain unnamed, he said some bad words, which apparently Lyndon Johnson was good at. And then he reached into his desk and he pulled out the Rockwell picture and said, this is what I look like. So he may have been uncooperative, but he liked it the best. Rockwell had this to say about Eisenhower, quote, Eisenhower had about the most expressive face I ever painted, I guess. Just like an actor's, very mobile, when he talked, he used all of his facial muscles, and he had a great wide mouth that I liked. When he smiled, it was just like the sun came out. In 1953, Rockwell lost his mother, Nancy. They really were never close, not even when he was a child. Then that October, he makes a surprise move to most 
And that is he takes his family and they go to Stockbridge, Massachusetts. They go there to a rental and then in March of the next year, just a few months, they actually buy a home. The reason that they're going is because Mary Rockwell is having some difficulties, real troubles. And there's a psychoanalyst in Stockbridge that they feel can treat her. Uh, one of her major problems was deep, deep depression. In September of that same year, 54, the post cover features breaking home ties. And coincidentally, this is the year that the Rockwell sons all leave home. A little bit more about that move. Mary had developed a very serious alcohol problem. And at the time, alcoholics were told that they could drink in social situations, but not in any other situations. Well, heck, when do you think she drank anyway? I mean, your social was when she drank. So it had gotten worse and worse and worse. And so that was one reason for the Stockbridge move, to get her some help. But Norman Rockwell also suffered bouts of deep depression. This was what caused him sometimes to be sitting there looking at a blank canvas and not having a clue what he was going to paint. He was depressed. So he also began scheduling treatment, counseling, to help him deal with his deep depression. This is a picture of the post cover, Breaking Home Ties, that was painted and produced the year that all three of the Rockwell boys left home. And you can see it's a, it's a poignant picture. Even the dog is sad. The dad, he's obviously a, a rural guy. He's there, he's sitting on the side of his car, his truck. His son's there with him. The dad is dressed as the dad you know always dresses. He's uh, got his hat in his hand. The boy has shiny new shoes. He's in a suit. He's in a tie that he's not quite too sure it's tied right, but he hopes so. And then beside him is his suitcase. And it has a little pendant on it that says state. He's going away to college. And the dog is just thinking, this is not going to end well. My buddy's going to leave me. From 1955 to 1957, Mary Rockwell's mental health continued to decline. She finally is admitted to a psychiatric hospital to get more intense treatments. Rockwell, on the advice of the doctors, makes a trip around the world. He's been invited uh, by Pan American to do an ad campaign for them. So this gets him out of the way so that they can treat Mary. Same time, Doubleday suggests to Rockwell that he ought to write an autobiography. He's interesting enough now. People you know, begin to want to know, know a little bit more about him. He decides that his son, Tom, who's a struggling writer trying to get a career going, that he'll be his ghost writer. In 1958, one of the Sentinel Awards that Rockwell will receive during his lifetime is this one. He's named the first member of the Society of Illustrators in New York's Hall of Fame. It's a double-edged sword. He's not the first member of the Society of Fine Artists. He's the Society of Illustrators. There's still art critics who, who see him as one who draws, not one who paints. In August of 1959, Mary Rockwell dies in her sleep. She has what they assume was a massive heart attack. Just about six weeks before, she had been doing very well, and the two of them go on a second honeymoon to New York City and do all the fun things that they love to do, and then she comes home and not long after is dead. It is almost impossible to separate Rockwell's life journey from the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. This is a portrait that he did of Kennedy when Kennedy was a candidate 
and it's the same portrait that the Post will put on its cover when Kennedy is assassinated. In February of 1960, Rockwell's anticipated autobiography is published. In October of that year, this portrait of JFK appears on the cover of Post. Then in 1961, in October, after a short courtship, Rockwell marries for the third time. Third time, she's a school teacher. All three of them have been school teachers. Her name is Molly Punderson, and she's a retired English teacher, and he meets her when he takes her modern poetry class, which she was teaching uh, just sort of as adult education. You didn't have to you didn't get grades or anything. It was just continuing ed. She's the one who will survive him. And frankly, after all I've read about all of the wives, I think she was the perfect wife at the perfect time for him. In 1963, in October, Rockwell becomes a life member of the NAACP. He's listened to Kennedy's message. He's horrified at Kennedy's death. In 1964, he paints a cover for Look magazine. The Saturday Evening Post is in a decline, rather precipitous decline. And the reason is that Look magazine has come on the scene and it is promoting photography, not art as we see it. Not a painting, but a photograph. And they do uh, pictorial essays where they just have sections in the magazine that are picture after picture after picture with just limited explanation of what it is. It's the beauty of photography, the beauty of the photograph. The Saturday Evening Post is conservative. It's on the decline. Rockwell wants to support the civil rights movement. Why not? He's a storyteller. In his whole life, he's focused on telling the story of America as he observes it. So he paints in 64 the problem we all live with for look. It's the first of several paintings that he's going to do that reflect the American Civil Rights Movement. And once more, he's telling America's story. If you look at it very closely, he was quite clever. This is why he's an artist. He was quite clever in presenting the figures, the marshals who are escorting the little girl to class. We don't see them above their shoulders. This emphasizes how big and powerful they are, and that emphasizes how small she is. And yet, she has a glorious figure, a, a feature on her face that looks like, I can do this. We're going to be okay. In 1968, a Rockwell exhibition opens in the Bernard Dannenberg Gallery in New York City. This is huge. This is the moment he's finally recognized as a fine artist. Rockwell is now fully and completely discovered as an artist. In 1975, The Problem We All Live With was the first painting bought by Stockbridge's Norman Rockwell Museum when the foundation had the money to do it. I cannot find how much they paid for it. I looked, I was curious. 1972, the whole 70s, this is his final decade. We're going to lose him in the 70s. And so it's interesting to see how he moves toward his death. In 1972, he begins work on what will be his final painting. It's an historical rending of a, a fact in history that happened near Stockridge that involved the uh, Native American chief and the head of the, the town's people. He never finishes it. He tries to. He goes back to it and back to it and back to it. But he has dementia beginning and he can't stick to it. 
The next year, he established the Norman Rockwell Art Collection Trust and gave custody of 189 of his paintings to the Norman Rockwell Museum, and that was in perpetuity. So he has taken what he considers his best, 189, and given them in trust to this, this area, this place, this trust, and they're gonna be at the Norman Rockwell Museum, although they will be loaned out for shows and so forth, but they're gonna to belong to the trust and the museum forever. 1976, his dementia has become more pronounced, but he's still painting every day. And in January of that year, he paints his last Boy Scout calendar. And then July of that year, he paints his final magazine cover. The title of it, it's July of 1776, got it. The name of it is Liberty Bell. And in it, uh, it's published in American Artist, which is a very fine, fine art magazine. Rockwell paints himself as the only human being in, in the picture. Here it is. And you see, there's the Liberty Bell, and there's Rockwell. He's got his signature pipe. He's got a cane now because he can't walk unless he has help. And he's wrapping a glorious happy birthday ribbon around the cracked Liberty Bell. I think it's a lovely picture. And the fact that it's his last cover, I like that too. The next year in 77, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Gerald Ford. And Ford described Rockwell in that presentation in this way. He said, as an artist, illustrator, and writer whose vivid and affectionate portraits of our country and ourselves have become a beloved part of the American tradition. November 8th, 1978, Rockwell dies at home in his bed. He's 84. His dementia had developed to the point by this time that he could no longer paint or draw. He basically was bedridden. But every day he still would go to his studio and stay there for the day. His uh, wife, Molly, and a caregiver would roll him down first in a wheelchair and in the latter year on a, a bed uh, so he could stay there. Rockwell said this about growing old. He said, the secret to so many artists living so long is that every painting is a new adventure. So you see, they're always looking ahead to something new and exciting. The secret is not to look back. His paintings so well. There's something about when you die, that kind of work suddenly becomes much more desirable. In 2014, The Rookie, the Red Sox locker room, sold for $22.5 million. The next year, 2015, his Rockwell Visits a Country Editor, sold for $11.5 million. And they keep going up. Saying grace is still, though, the one that's brought the highest price. His keen use of humor in his paintings is cited by most of the art historians, the art critics, and ordinary Americans as the key to his long-term success. I don't know. Was he a fine artist? Was he an illustrator? The year before he dies, Gerald Ford calls him an artist an illustrator, I mean, they can't, quite, they can't quite separate the two. I come down on the side that he's a fine artist, partly because I believe his art will endure. Here's the thing. Those magazine covers last as long as the magazine paper will last. But every one of those covers started as a piece of fine art a painting that he did. 
So that's my argument for him being a fine artist. I hope you've enjoyed this. I found Norman Rockwell to be far more interesting, frankly, than I had anticipated. I also found him to be far more eccentric than I had anticipated. But I also found his work to be more meaningful to me now that I know something about his life. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it too. 